News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. It's that time of year when businesses and organizations are wrapping up this year's business and making plans for next year. The same thing goes for the Idaho State Legislature. As a last order of business in 2022, lawmakers came to the Capitol building in Boise recently for orientation. Part of orientation is picking chamber seats and electing new leadership in both houses. First, former Speaker of the House, Republican Scott Bedke of Oakley was elected Lieutenant Governor in November. That means he'll serve as President of the Senate. Senate Senator Chuck Winder of Meridian retains his role as Senate President Pro Tem by a unanimous vote. And Representative Mike Moyle of Star was elected as the new Speaker of the House. The first session of the 67th Idaho Legislature starts Monday, January 9th with Governor Brad Little's State of the State Address. And the Republicans will once again hold a supermajority in both houses in 2023. Here's how it breaks down. The State Legislature's website shows Republicans hold 28 seats in the Senate. The Democrats hold only seven. In the House, Republicans outnumber Democrats 59 to 11. Also, there's been a lot of turnover in the legislature. By my count, there will be 40 new legislators among the 105 total because of redistricting and retirements. On the other side of the aisle, the Democrats once again elected Representative Ilana Rubel of Boise as House Minority Leader. Senator Melissa Wintrow of Boise takes over as Senate Minority Leader for Senator Michelle Stennett, who is retiring. Representative Rubel and Senator Wintrow will be my guests next week here on Viewpoint to discuss the Democrats' priorities for 2023, but today we're focusing on the Republican priorities and the big issues in the legislature. My guests are Senate President Pro Tem Chuck Winder, right to my right here, and new Speaker of the House, Representative Mike Moyle. First of all, gentlemen, congratulations on being elected by your peers as leaders. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Um, let's talk about that makeup of the House and Senate. Um, Forty new legislators, brand, legislators, brand new, haven't served in either house before. How does that affect the dynamic um, when you have that many new people coming? Well, you know, we had a 50% turnover in the Senate. Uh, some of those are House members that are coming across and we're using them for, uh, in some cases, to be chairman of committee because we didn't have enough returning incumbents to uh, fill all those positions of leadership and committee chairs. So it has a big impact. The committees will be different, uh, be different makeup uh, in the committees. So. It's going to have a huge impact, I think, on the makeup of the Senate. I think the reality of the Senate, it's still going to be a very thoughtful body. It's still going to do its work for the people, and uh, we'll get our job done and go home hopefully the end of March, 1st of April, and uh, people will be uh, pleased with what we do. With that being said, Representative Moyle, is um, the learning curve and being able to really become an active member of the legislature, how, how big is that curve? Well, for some, it'll be bigger than others, but it'll be an opportunity for everybody to learn and grow together. You'll see on the House, we'll, because of the, the new folks, we'll have more caucuses, more educational sessions, and try to bring them along. Once they learn, though, they, they hit the ground fast, and they'll, be, they'll, they'll get it. They'll be passing bills and like their old pros, but it's just a little bit of a learning curve on the front end. Yeah, and I need to ask you about one of the big pieces of news that came out last week, um, your decision to take one seat away from the uh, Democrats on the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee, the legislature's Joint Budget Writing Committee. Um, why did you decide to take that one seat away? Yeah, for over 20 years that I can think of, the Democrats have been overrepresented on that committee. And with the new folks, I felt like it was a time to give some other people an opportunity. The minority party is still overrepresented as a whole on all the committees in the House. And I thought if, we were gonna, if they were going to be overrepresented, I thought it was time that maybe some other people had a chance to serve there. Just a way to break things up and give other people an opportunity, especially with the new guys. Because if you look at our appropriation committee, they're all new, but what, two? One had been there before. So, so it, there's a learning curve again, and it's yeah. an opportunity for everybody to be involved. And, and we actually did that a few years ago when there were only six uh, Democratic senators. We actually reduced the... Uh, the participation on some committees, and it's basically based on the ratio. Right. Okay. And I mean, when, it, when you're talking 16 to 4 Republican majority on JFAC, now 17 to 3, does it really make a difference? It's it's still the, the makeup similar to the others. I mean, if it doesn't make a difference, why are you asking me? I mean, because it makes a difference to some people. And that's the hard part when you get in these leadership roles, is trying to be fair mm -hmm. to everybody, both the minority and the majority. And I'll remind you, they're still overrepresented on the other side. So we tried to be fair, mm -hmm. but to give everybody an opportunity. Let's talk about one of the big issues, of course, that has been talked about throughout 2022, and that is the state's new strict anti-abortion law. Still being lit litigation right now. Do either of you gentlemen expect any um, work to be done on the original bill as it's, or law um, as it stands to kind of clean up some of that 
what people would call vague language in there about what doctors can and cannot do when it comes to performing an abortion for like an ectopic pregnancy or a partial um, Yeah, I could probably address that. Um, I think that the uh, medical community has read too much into the existing law and have become very skeptical of what it's saying, and that started from the very beginning. Uh, I don't think it was ever our intent to uh, take away uh, normal standards of care for women uh, in those types of situations. Uh, I think you'll see some uh, people this time that'll try and, uh, you know, uh, take away uh, rape and incest uh, mm -hmm. and life and, you know, the mother uh, away as an exception. But I think the majority of people, at least that I've talked to, uh, feel that there need to be some exceptions, and particularly when it's a medical issue, we're trying to get rid of elective abortions. Mm -hmm. And the reporting aspect of it with incest seems restrictive in the sense that you have a young girl who might be terrified of the person who assaulted them. And, you know, is that going too far in that bill? Um, I think from the standpoint of... Uh, I mean, by filing, they have to file yeah, a police Yeah, right, report. they have to file a report. Um, you know, I guess it's kind of trying to figure out a way to provide some kind of standard uh, of, uh, you know, that an incident occurred. If a rape occurred, that, mm -hmm. you know, that it was reported. And I think we are trying to encourage and support uh, women when they are uh, assaulted. And so I think there's kind of that balance that has to occur. I don't think it's a, uh, a significant uh, problem because we're trying to maintain that, but there are some that are going to try and actually get rid of those as exemptions. Okay, so we'll see some bills probably coming up. Yep, you'll see some, that. I'm sure. Okay, Representative Moyle, in the, the last um, special session this summer in September, um, lawmakers passed, of course, you know, massive tax cuts and rebates, but also that $410 million for public education without directing it somewhere. Where would you like to see it go, or what are you hearing from your caucus about me what would like to be done? Me personally, I'd like to see some property tax relief out of and, and also some improvements in education. I mean, everybody's got an idea, and that's the good part about the way we did that. Everybody will have a chance to have a say in where that money goes. And you're hearing, like I said, uh, property tax relief, uh, some stuff with ADA. You're talking about school choice, and maybe moving some money around to these kids that are going to private schools, homeschool. So there's a lot of options on the table. And that was a good part about the bill. The new guys will have a say in that, and they can determine where they want it to go. How would property tax work into the $400 million that's for well, you, public schools? Well, you could do property tax relief, for example, if you relieve districts of some of their payments on bonds or supplementals or safe school issues. You know, there's things you could do with some of that money to relieve give some relief on the property tax side and help those school districts, for example, that can't pass a bond. And, and we've also had a working, uh, we've had a working group uh, looking at the issue of how we finance our schools in Idaho. Uh, that's a huge part of the property tax burden. Uh, if we can figure that out and provide some uh, funding, you know, and maybe it's a grant program or whatever it is, but uh, we are looking at that. That could uh, provide significant property tax relief also. And um, just in general now, and we'll talk about these more specifically in the, in the next segment too, but what, what do you see as the top priorities for Republicans um, and the, the heading into this next legislative session? Well, I think they're always the same, basically. They're dealing with uh, less government, trying to reduce regulation, uh, trying to reduce taxation, uh, provide for individual liberties. I think those are all the main uh, pieces of legislation you'll see come through. Some will pass, some won't. Uh, we usually pass somewhere around 25% of the bills that are drafted in a given session, and that's, you know, several hundred. Mm -hmm. uh, so there'll be a lot of work to do. And when you say personal freedoms, what kinds of things are you referring to? Well, I think, you know, look what we went through back during the uh, COVID uh, situation and mandatory vaccinations and those types of things. I think, you know, people basically rose up and said, you know, we don't want to wear masks. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to get vaccinated if we don't want to. Um, I think those are all important. I sec think Second Amendment rights are really important rights, uh, particularly as we look around, you know, Idaho's different than maybe a Connecticut or a Massachusetts or, you know, and so I think, we, one, we have to protect those rights mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yet provide for safety for people. And Speaker Moyle, how about for you on, on the House side of this, um, what are you seeing as the priorities? I think you're going to have the same, some of the old ones, like property tax. We'll keep nipping away at that, trying to get some more relief there. You're, you're going to have some issues that people aren't talking about, too. Uh, Medicaid, for example. Medicaid expansion is up for review this year. Mm. Medicaid surpassed uh, 
public education school funding last year. We've got to get our hands around that, and so I'm hoping we can do some things there to, to stop that from breaking the state, basically. You've got other issues that always seem to flow to the top. We've got a water issue in eastern Idaho. I'd still like to fix some of the issues in regards to the rules and how the rules in the state of Idaho apply and are approved. And, 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 and the judicial stuff. There's still talk about the bill that the governor vetoed last year. There's been a task force that's been working on that, and hopefully we can find a solution to that issue also. So there's a lot of other issues that will float up. But the budgets are always the key one. Mm -hmm. And this year with the surplus and the things that are going on, it makes it hard. If you have a year where you're short of money, we can get in and out. But this year you've got a lot of money sitting on the table. And so there'll be a lot of uh, back and forth on how to spend that money. A little headbang in there. For exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think anytime you have a lot of new people in, you're going to get some old ideas that are resurfaced and come back in. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully it's not a longer session than than uh, first part of April, but it could be. All right, so we'll see you at the end of May. Yeah. For the no, <laughs> end of March. No, 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 no. End of March. End of March, okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break right here, and when we come back, we'll continue the conversation with Senator Winder and Speaker Moyle on the Republican priorities for the 2023 legislative session. Snow is in the air, and it's beginning to look a lot like savings during the holiday sale at Furniture Row. Stop in today because everything is on sale. That means huge discounts storewide on living, dining, bedroom, and mattresses. Plus, decorating your entire home just got easier with four years no interest financing. So pack up the sleigh, pick up grandmother on the way, and shop the largest selection at the lowest prices guaranteed. Happy holidays from Furniture Row. There's never been a better time to get away. With a great deal on the Hyundai you've always wanted. With America's best warranty and up to three years complimentary maintenance. It's your journey. Own every mile at the Hyundai Getaway Sales Event. Hurry in to get our best deals of the season. Get in and get away. Get 0% APR plus no payments for 90 days or up to $12.50 in savings on select models. See your Bronco Motors Hyundai dealer. Join us on Idaho Today, Thursdays at 1230 for HealthLink Idaho, a segment featuring educational topics on how to keep you and your family safe and healthy. HealthLink Idaho, Thursdays on Idaho Today, sponsored by the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. You know it when you hear it. And you know where to go. Primary Health Urgent Care. Multiple locations for every season that makes you sneeze. Welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. The 2023 Idaho Legislative Session begins Monday, January 9th with Governor Brad Little's State of the State Address. Today, we're focusing on the Republican priorities for the session. Next week, my guests will be the Democratic leaders in the House and Senate. Once again, my guests today are Senate President Pro Tem Chuck Winder and new Speaker of the House, Representative Mike Moyle. Um, we talked a little bit about education funding right. and whatnot, but getting back to the public schools, um, what is the key issue, do you think, that needs to be tackled with public schools coming into this session? Well, I think, you know, there was a Supreme Court ruling that uh, said you could use money, uh, public taxpayer money, in private schools. We've always tried to avoid that as much as possible, but I think there'll be some pressure on that to, uh, we don't have a lot of private schools in uh, Idaho, but there'll be some pressure to have that money follow the student, allow the parent to have that choice. Where do you stand on that? Uh, well, I, th you know, I th support the public schools. We have a constitutional obligation to fund our public schools, to have a you know, thorough, free education uh, for our uh, young people. Uh, so that needs to you know, come as a first priority. But we also start, have to start moving towards more parental choice and giving alternatives for kids, whether it's a magnet school or a charter school within a district or whatever. Uh, so I think you know, there's going to be a lot of attention on education. It's the highest priority of the public. Uh, so uh, you'll see a lot of attention given to that this year. And um, Speaker Moyle, on that issue of school choice and the money following the student, whether it's in public or private schools, where do you stand? Oh, I support the, the money following child. I always have. But you've, you've got some dynamics there you've got to be careful with. Uh, some of our homeschool 
friends don't want that. They're worried about regulation following them. You've got some others that are concerned that it will harm the, the, the public school system on the other side. So I think you're, there's, a, there's a sweet spot there that we can find an answer, a solution that everybody can agree to, but I think it's gonna take some time and work because right now both sides are in their corners and wanting to fight and somewhere in the middle is where we probably ought to be. And I think we can get there. The committees, they'll have a chance to get more education on the issue and, and see the different factions that are involved. I think we can find a solution. And you know, we still hear a lot about teacher shortage, the, the challenges of retaining and recruiting good teachers in Idaho. Uh, as far as teacher pay goes, where do you well, we've, you know, we've put significant amount of money into teacher pay in the last uh, five years and because we've had that money to do it, uh, historic investments. Uh, so we are trying to do that and recognize uh, the experience in, in education at various levels for educators. Uh, I really think, you know, that our Percy program, our benefits are good. We just last year uh, passed a bill that uh, allowed us to pay for a health insurance for uh, teachers, so would it be equalized across the districts in the state? So we're trying to do whatever we can to retain them, and we'll continue to work on salaries. But that's not the only issue that needs to be looked at too within the schools. Yeah, one of the big issues you hear, especially in rural Idaho, is the issue of the buildings. A lot of the mm. our rural friends can't pass right. bonds, and there's some issues there. And we might be able to do some more stuff with the bond equalization to help pay for that if they do pass the bonds and along that run. But, but as I've traveled the state, that's been another issue with education has been the buildings and the and, and the safety. Aging and yeah, yeah aging, and then you know, and, yeah, and, and some folks don't, you know, they don't want their taxes to go out to pay for a building, and so we've got to be careful how we handle that issue. But it's mm -hmm. one I think you'll hear about this year. Another issue, of course, here is um, transportation infrastructure. The legislature's done a lot in recent years as far as funding for that. We're seeing the I-84 corridor opening up now through Nampa and Caldwell. I'm sure you're happy that the 16, Highway 16 the is coming down from Star to the to the interstate eventually. Um, do you see anything major happening in terms of transportation funding infrastructure this year? Well, I think, you know, there's some significant programs at the federal level going on so that'll have some impact. Uh, I think, you know, we basically put together a $1.6 billion uh, program similar to Garvey, but it would be using federal funds, or excuse me, state funds. Uh, so I think, you know, we're doing a lot of things to invest in infrastructure. It's so important to our business. It's important to our uh, safety of our citizens in Idaho. So you'll continue to see, I think, historic investments in education and transportation. In the Department of Transportation is doing a really good job. The problem they're having now, I think, is finding contractors since mm. there's been a, you know, there's the money's there and they've done a good job of moving the projects up. We met with them yesterday and, and, and things are a lot better than anywhere. We all want it done tomorrow. It takes time to get those projects done, but we're moving in the right direction across the whole state. Yeah, and you mentioned water earlier. I mean, you know, it's a topic that may make some people's eyes glaze over, but when you think about how important it is with the Snake River Plain Aquifer, and the recharging efforts in there. What do you see happening in terms of that? It's not just the Eastern Snake Plain, my friends. We here in the Treasure Valley, the Treasure Valley Aquifer Plan should be out. It's supposed to been out over a year ago. We still haven't seen it. But we have the same issue now as we drill wells for homes, as, the, as our city folks and municipalities put in these deep wells for city water. Uh, we're gonna be eventually deplete that aquifer. We're blessed in this valley right now because there's still a lot of agricultural land and we still flood irrigate, which recharges that aquifer. But as that irrigated land turns into, you know, rooftops and, and asphalt, that recharge is going to go away. And I can give you examples if you care, but it, it's going to be an issue not only in eastern Idaho, but in, in southwestern Idaho also. And so we need to get ahead of the curve. Once that Treasure Valley Aquifer plan comes out, we can start looking at doing some recharge projects here in the Treasure Valley, which would be good, I believe. But we have to get that out first. But we need to be cognizant that as we drill more and more wells and deplete that aquifer, that there's going to be a day of reckoning. So we need to be careful and plan ahead. With just a little bit of time we have left, I want to ask you about the leadership positions. You are taking over for the longest serving Speaker of the House mm -hmm. in Idaho history. Um, and you come in, you know, uh, there are battles within the Republican Party with different factions as well as, you know, with the Democrats. What are you learning so far about the, um, the dynamics in, in your caucus? Well, I've been involved with the dynamics as majority leader for quite True. some time now. And, and I think sometimes uh, what the press thinks the big problems are really aren't what the big problems are waiting in those back rooms. 
So I've, I've really been doing my best as the new speaker to try to bring the groups together. We have common ground. There's a lot of things we all agree on, and we need to focus on the things we agree on and, and work to the work to finding solutions versus standing in our corners and throwing mud at each other. And I hope I can accomplish that. It's going to be tough with these new guys, but we've got some really, really good people here, and I think we can get there. It's just going to take a little time. And for you, Senator Winder, as, as um, Senate President Pro Tem, how, and we only have about 30 seconds, but how do you view your role now heading into the second time? Well, I think it's the way it's always been. I'm elected to serve the Senate, and so it's my job to provide mentorship and leadership to everyone. Uh, so I think with the new people coming in, I think there was an expectation by some they'd vote as a block. Uh, they're not going to do that. They're pretty independent thinkers. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be a good Senate, and I think they'll be thoughtful and reasonable as we move forward. And it'll certainly be interesting to see how things play out once again, starting yeah. on January 9th. Sure. Senator Winder, Speaker Moyle, thank you so much for your time for coming thank in today. Thanks for and having us. And happy holidays. Great to see you. you thank same you. to you. Well, up next on Viewpoint, where's the Boise bench and why should we care? It's beginning to look a lot like savings during the holiday sale at Furniture Row. Stop in today because everything is on sale, plus four years no interest. Shop the largest selection at the lowest prices guaranteed. Happy holidays from Furniture Row. Hey, thanks for working through the holidays. Clara, Dad says you're working over Christmas. Here you go, Mrs. Parson. Let me pay you. No, you're not going to pay me. We are the helping It's time to replace your old tub with a new shower, but you don't want the hassle or the worry of getting it finished. You just want to pick a style and relax, knowing that it'll be wonderful when it's done. Is that too much to ask? No, actually it's not. Rebath, from start to stunning. Call us or visit rebath.com and save $1,250 off your complete bathroom remodel. Would you like to borrow some money to hire the Count Danny Coker to pimp out your Zamboni? Well, we just may be able to help. Get up to five grand in minutes all online at don'tbebroke.com. Sweet! Yeah. I pimped the Zamboni with a big DK smile. Apply online at don'tbebroke.com. It's the holiday sale at Denver Mattress. Right now, purchase any Tempur-Pedic and get a free $300 gift. Or check out the Summit Firm for only $279.99. Plus, four years no interest with no down payment and free shipping. The holiday sale, on now at Denver Mattress. Have you ever wondered how the Boise bench got its name? We wondered about that and where exactly the bench is. So, Brian Holmes looked into it. Okay, the Boise bench. Where is it? Well, first, let's look at the layout of the valley carved out by the Boise River well before it even had a name. Tens of thousands of years of mountain snow melting and water running downhill unchecked created the levels we know today. There's the lower level, basically the river and all of downtown Boise westward. Then the next level, well, that would be the bench. West from Federal Way north from the Boise Airport, and east from Cole Road. Literally, like a bench, a place for your feet and a place for your seat. So that's geographically what the Boise bench uh, has historically been considered and even what residents um, as early as, as 1900 would have considered the Boise bench. As for how the bench should be considered historically, the next chapter outside of that first five years of, of downtown core development. That first chapter began months after Idaho became a territory. In fact, Boise City was platted uh, and established on July 7th, 1863. So a city was started and getting in and out of it, well, those days, that meant trains. But before you can have railroad, you have to have water. Thus, the next chapter, which developed by diverting water south from the Boise River with the Reidenbach Canal in 1865. While all that was happening, in 1871, a man named William Morris moved to town. 
And again, we don't know a lot about William Morris, but we do know that he was involved with a number of, of organizations, a number of businesses. One of those as a manager of the Northwest Stage Lines. However, his duties, and apparently his disposition, were often disagreeable, as noted by a historian from the 1890s. An antique specimen of human nature encased in a body which was just a trifle larger than his soul and conscience. He was a mass of prejudices and sinuous vindictiveness. The reason I mention him, although he deserves to be forgotten, is that his character should go on record for what it was. And, in addition, the names of the decent men connected with that corporation should be made more brilliant by comparison with him. Okay, so as a person, he may deserve to be forgotten, but as a property owner, not so much. The man with a mass of prejudices managed to amass a lot of land. And he was kind of the founder of the Boise Bench because he took action to acquire almost, well, more than 17,000 acres of land south of town on the bench uh, through the Desert Land Act. Which made more acreage available for a lot less money. Then Morris was also able to get a lot of farmers and businessmen to help finish the Reidenbach Canal. By 1891, there's more than 100 miles of ditch, 153 laterals within this Reidenbaugh system, and it irrigates 22,000 acres of land on the bench. A flood irrigation system that allowed for the blossoming of orchards, like apples, plums, and peaches. And it's a system that is still in place today, and why the bench became one of Boise's first suburbs. You cannot talk about the history of the city of Boise without acknowledging that the Boise bench is woven into that fabric. And you might also know the name Morris from Morris Hill Cemetery. And you know, the bench wasn't only Boise's first suburb, it also became home to Idaho's first shopping center, the Vista Village on Vista. That's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you later today on the news at five and 10, and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint when my guests will be Democratic leaders in both the State House and the State Senate. Have a great rest of your day.